happening thousands of times uh, greater luxury than what we have today. You know, it's not uh, impossible that there was meteoritic material available for some of this chemistry. John, did you hear that? And do you want to respond? I did. Yeah, no, I did. And, and so there are various people who said life must have started after the LHB because it's too destructive. There are other people who said, no, it could survive that. And there are people like Steve Mott who said, you know, it could easily survive that. And in fact, the top you know, conditions could have actually led to selection for uh, survival of thermophilic organisms, which phylogeny can suggest we root down to. So, yeah, I mean, I'm perfectly happy with chemistry you know, occurring at the LHB. I quite like the idea of meteorites inducing the sort of conditions you need. Because another thing that meteorites Environment can do is generate atmospheric hydrogen cyanide. People like Jim Casting and others, many others actually, have pointed out that the shock energy from meteorite impact is a great way of making hydrogen cyanide. Other questions? John, I have two or three comments and, and also a question. My first comment is wow, that's W O W. Very impressive presentation. Thank you so much. The second comment is about this whole notion of systems chemistry. It's troubled me from, a, from the outset, I suppose, that is the notion of once we've done these complex experiments, will we be able to break them down into the, the specific chemical reactions that took place? And obviously you have, so I'm much relieved about, about that, my concern about systems chemistry. But, but John, I, I, I actually reread your proposal before I read your report. And in the proposal, you make the statement, quote, we will investigate, I think like seven different times. And I'm wondering, I think some of those seven you haven't done, I believe. Maybe you didn't intend to get them done in the first year. But others weren't, that you've done weren't even in your proposal. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, absolutely. Because the, so Harry, it, it's, it, in this area, perhaps more than any other, you write a proposal, and it's a really good thing to do because it makes you orchestrate your thoughts and, and basically sum up what you know at the time and how you would go forward. And then you do an experiment, and one of your people does an experiment, and it does something slightly different to what you expect. Like it doesn't work, for example, that's the common experiment. Or it works, and it gives something different to what you know. And that's when it gets exciting. And then you just have to change direction. And so in reality in this area, and I think you know, all of us will agree to a certain extent that what you set out to do in its entirety, then no resemblance to what you actually end up having done in its entirety. The general theme, which was that I think we call the proposal reconciling the RNA and iron sulfur worlds, the general theme of reconciling the divided position has been a constant. Uh, to the research and investigating uh, the role of metabolism in particular in RNA to see if it gives any new lead has been a constant in the research. But when it comes down to details, you know, the stuff we wrote down, we, we put something because that's what we thought. And hey, yeah. that's, that's the way it is. John, did, what, was there a moment when a light bulb went on in your head that said that one, this complex mineral, could in fact produce an abundance of, of the starting materials. And was there a moment in time when uh, something flashed? The only flash in any of this was simply when we saw the, the, the work that the physical and inorganic chemists have, have done was beautiful work, you know. And, and we're all guilty of this as well, which is that when we do something, we do it in our own with our own mindset, right? And so these guys have done something, and then I looked at it and I just thought these guys are generating electrons. In the presence of hydrogen cyanide, those electrons must reduce the cyanide. And we, you know, so we, we literally, the first experiment we did, me and Guy did it, we can, and, and then, then Claudia would be involved in this as well. Go down to the NMR machine, the, the spectrometer that prints out this data, it's got on a TV screen, you see you see, and immediately you know you perform some pretty weird organic synthesis because you get these. these so that was that was a 
we, well, it was, a more, it was less polite than wow, Harry. <laughs> well, it was a well-intended wow. Are there other comments or questions from anyone? Yeah, I'll ask a couple. Did you hear me there? Yes. So, John, um, on your uh, plot with the uh, kind of your proto metabolism, which is, is, is quite impressive. Um, so, I'm glad to see that you've got some hydrogen cyanide chemistry going because these are some of the areas that and iron chemistry, which can be difficult in today's atmosphere, and also the smells they generate. People don't tend to do them. And, uh, right, and, uh, that's a good, good way to drive people out of the lab. And I think that, but we have to own up to that, that that might have been some of the chemistry that was on the prebiotic earth. That might have been some of the most uh, important. But it's also, it's, it's complicated stuff too, and HCN as well. So the question I had on this is you have some reactions here where they're, they're sequential with the arrows, like sometimes it's hydrogen cyanide, sometimes it's hydrogen sulfide. Um, so how compatible are these? Because what we'd expect that these would be mixed gases in an atmosphere, and you'd have some solubility to them, you'd have the reaction. So you know, can you point to some of these that are compatible, that they can be both present in there that you've tested, and then maybe some that aren't, just to get some idea about how robust it is? So this was the idea, Nick, about having the, if you heat the ferrocyanide and get potassium cyanide, if potassium cyanide is generated a solid, over a metal sulfide, when you add water to that, you generate a solution containing cyanide, dissolves the metal sulfide, and get H2S liberated in solution. But it's PKA is 7. So if your H is above 7, the hydrogen sulfide is not liberated as a gas, it's liberated as HS minus. So it stays soluble. The hydrogen cyanide, again, if it's above a certain pH, pH 9.2, it's anionic, so it's soluble. But if you produce these and then shine light on them, you can get this chemistry occurring before, you've had, before they've had time to evaporate or, or basically go out of solution. So I, I think the, if you thermalize ferrocyanide and get cyanide that way, then this chemistry becomes plausible. If you want to do it, on the other hand, on that concentration of hydrogen cyanide, which you get at equilibrium when you have an atmosphere in contact with a body of water, I think it's too dilute. Okay. I actually haven't had too much of a problem with that side of it too, because I've also thought that if we had uh, if we had an equilibrium with the formamide there, you're going to have ammonium formate, you're going to have HCN, and those will be in a soluble form, right? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think the formamide is is actually central to a lot of it. You know this obviously, but the formamide is, is pretty central. But cyanide itself has this property, which is that you can reduce it with electrons really easily because you get, a, you get a, an immunal radical anion, which is stable. And so it's, it's, it's good chemistry reducing hydrogen cyanide. Okay. Another question for you is, um, I'm quite intrigued when I saw this with the uh, lipid formation, which I'm sure David Diemer is as well, and that kind of connects with, um, you're using essentially an imidazole activated uh, fatty acid. Yep. And um, so, can you tell me something about the synthesis of that prebiotically? It doesn't look like it's too bad, but uh, just wonder about it. So I think the carboxylic acids we're not too worried about because fischer troch chemistry, I think, is quite well accepted. The activation of the carboxylic acid is like activation of phosphate. You know, we, and, and I think you as well, make use cyanoamidazole. As, a, a, as an activating agent, which is, you know, is that plausible prebiotically? I don't know. I think there is a general need to have carboxylate acid and phosphate activating agents in prebiotic chemistry. The one that we're really interested in, actually, at the moment, is isonitriles. Isonitriles are really good carboxylate and phosphate activating agents. And isonitriles can be generated by dehydration of formamide. So if you heat an amine in formamide, the sort of temperature that you know, your guys do over there, and, and we've been doing, and, and Greg Springsteen, and so on, then your amine will get formulated 
to a formamide and then dehydrated to an isonitrile. So isonitriles, I think, would actually be the place we're going to look for activation chemistry. Okay. I'll, I'll point out, though, too, I think that um, without the activation, I think if you get to the phosphate, the glycerol phosphate, uh, David Diemer has shown that he can he can get some coupling of fatty acids to glycerol, so without any activation too. So it could even be more robust, I think. Yeah, so it's, it's really it's really a yield issue actually in that reaction because if you if you look at the CVC of the uh, carboxylic acid, let's say octamoic acid for a CVC of 150 millimolar, that diacyl phospholipid we make has got a CVC of uh, at snake of about three millimolar. So it's a pretty good membrane forming amplifier. But you need to form it in a decent yield. And mm -hmm. so the yield there, you know, the mono one we can get in 50, 60 percent, but this one at C eight can be thirty or forty percent. So they're formed in such good yield that vesicles just spontaneously assemble as the reaction progresses. And then cap they happen to encapsulate anything that, that's also in the reaction medium. Yeah, one, one reason I love the also drying rehydration cycles because the lipids dry down and then they encapsulate when they rehydrate, as Dave has shown. So, yeah, it fits yeah, into yeah. some of your scenarios. I, I, I think there's lots of brilliant work on vesicles, you know, already. And the only contribution I think this makes to vesicles is just to say that here's a high yielding reaction that makes diacyl phospholipids. Okay. Um, on your on your UV light. I, I just interject there. If you're using the 254 lamp, if you haven't done so, check it for shorter wavelengths. We, yeah, it will it will be uh, shorter wavelengths as well, and we can filter them out. Okay. Um, we want to do this with a tunable UV laser, but we don't have money to buy one. Okay. This. Um, that is. Oh, oh no. Uh, well, just also when we were doing some of the 254 nanometer light. Um, Work with Tom Orlando, we saw some reactions happening that we thought that's peculiar and went back and got a full spectrum on it, saw that we actually had some 180 coming out. So, just a cautionary note. Yeah, yeah, so the, this, this is done in, in, it's, it's done in quartz ware. So, basically, anything that gets through quartz that's emitted by a medium pressure lamp can be in there. Okay. And that's, it's, it's not far off. It's far off what sunlight is, but sunlight goes down very low. Yeah. You have no yeah. So, so you weigh these things on the plausibility. But yeah, I mean, we, you can get a lamp made, but it's a special order. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Are there other comments or questions? Sir? Nick, Nick, were you done? Yeah, I'm, I'm set. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Um, we haven't heard from Matt. And I wouldn't mind, either John or Matt, could you tell me roughly how was the work divided between Cambridge and London? Well, that's going into great Matt, detail. But. Matt can tell you more, but essentially what what we've done is that sort of you know, Matt and I meet sort of you know actually we tend to meet in London because it's it's more fun for me in Cambridge. Sorry, Matt. Uh, and we talk about this and we discuss what we're doing and so on, and it's and that sort of in a collaborative sense has worked really well. Matt's just setting his lab up, or has just set his lab up. Our lab's been set up for three years, so it's it's easier for me to sort of you know sort of give the bulk presentation if you like. But Matt, Matt, I think has got some slides as well. Matt, have you got some slides to show Harry as well? But you, but okay. But what we did was put everything in the report, and you can see you know in the report essentially that the two. You don't want to be so, you know, on the Can you hear me now? Yes, me. Hi, Matt. Oh, sorry, I muted myself, uh, so I didn't disturb John. <laughs> As requested, but forgot. I, I have slides. Um, we, I, we can explain what we've been doing. Um, more, more looking at new, more looking at nucleotides. John's clearly been looking at amino acids, the lipids. Um, it depends how long you want. Our collaboration to talk for. Um, I can I can I can add to this if you like. Uh, Matt, Matt makes a good point, Harry. I mean, just looking at the clock now, it's, we've got okay. to steal everyone else. Actually. 
Okay, understood. So, unless there are further questions, John and Matt, thank you both very much. Wonderful presentation, John. I was much, much impressed. I suggest we, uh, it's now 10.15. How about we uh, take a five or 10 minute break? Uh, let's uh, try to convene no later than 10.25, maybe even 10.20. And you're both, uh, we'll leave the cameras running. We'll leave the, the show on and you're welcome to talk with one another. But I'm gonna take a little break myself. Bye for now. We need to do <laughs> I'm going to get us something to drink. Okay. <laughs> office, Matt. Say again? In your office. I'm in my office, yeah. Which means I can't stay all night. <laughs> no, exactly. If this runs past the eight hours, I can't get home. What time do your train stop? Um, half past 11, the last one that takes me home. So, which is bizarre, right? But, uh, it's life. Both, both Matt and I, Nick, have just come back from the US, so uh, it's been quite a, quite a week. Oh, so is this in a, any way in conjunction with the Simons Foundation? Uh, well, in a very limited way. I went to see Jack Shostak in the US. I just wanted to say congratulations to you both for uh, that. This is fantastic. It's, it went out of the blue, right? I literally got a got an email saying, you know, would you like to come to New York and talk about your work in case we might want to fund it? <laughs> I went to the lab and said, which one of you guys is, you know, pulling my leg? Yeah, who set me up? That, that, that doesn't happen, yeah. And after about 30 minutes, Hey, it might be real. Well, good for you. I'm happy for you guys. This this is cool. I the only um, discussion I've had to, um, trying to think of who to talk to, but uh, I was Jason Dorkin called me about something uh, the other day, so we talked. Uh, so I heard a little bit about it, but it sounds it sounds fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 no, I was. Yeah, I think that's also an amazing Google scientific presentation. You guys very, very good. That's fantastic. I can't hear you. Can you talk to the Nobel Prize list someday? Seriously? So we went to Sci Fu and uh, I went to Scripps and saw Donna and Jerry as well. Yeah, fantastic career. How about you, Nick? What have you been up to this summer? Um, let's see, one thing that's kind of interesting, you know there's this group in Tokyo that has this LC Center? Yeah, no, they've got, they've got a hundred million dollars or something, haven't they? So, so they, they asked me to come over there, and I went over there in the uh, beginning of June. Uh -huh. And uh, it's, it's an interesting mix. You know, they asked me just to come over to, to talk to them. They've had different people in, and uh, I think they're still kind of finding their way on stuff. And they've got a bunch of, you know, it kind of grew out of a geochemistry thing. Right? Oh, so, so, I mean, oof, you know, talk about bottom up, as in bottom up, as in like the core of the earth, bottom up, you know, I mean, that's, it's more on that side. And so yeah. it, it's interesting to talk to these guys because there's some people that know stuff about um, what is the core of the earth like. And, you know, so I, I learned some stuff. Quite a bit of stuff. It's it's interesting. I mean, they, you know, one of these guys there has um, found that the, I, you know, in a nutshell, as I understand it, the melting temperature of the core is lower than we used to think it is, and so that means that it can't be all iron. It's got to have all this hydrogen. You know, he's done all these calculations. But actually, I mean, that that has major implications because then we could have maybe in a prebiotic curse as much hydrogen as we want, not, you know, H2 just spewing out, right? So the chemistry gets pretty easy then, right? Uh, uh, yeah, it's, the more reduced it is, the better it is, right? It's, it makes it easy. It makes it a lot easier. So, you know, that's, so some of the, you know, discussions, they just had us all talk about, um, they asked me to do an RNA world thing, show some of your slides, because they said, not just your own work, what are the different, you know, ideas out there, you know, how they're being pursued. And, um, you know, I think that they're looking for what are their connections that they have in Tokyo to different, 
you know, ideas out there. But, you know, they've got a real mix. Uh, they've got those people that are on that core of the earth thing, and then they've got some people doing unnatural peptides, um, and then they've got somebody that's doing, like, the emergence of land plants and stuff. So let's, we'll see how it comes together. I mean, I think it's good, isn't it, to have as many community people around the world getting into this. It's, it's, it's fun. So Matt and I and Irene are, the week after next, we're all going to Germany. The Max Planck Society are holding a conference on this as well. So That's great. I mean, a German approach, a Japanese approach, an American approach, a small UK approach. That's cool. <laughs> Funded by America. <laughs> Funded by America. <laughs> uh, yeah. Pretty much Funded by Wall Street, I hear. Yeah, which is pretty wild. It's like an Apple computer, at least. It says designed in America, built in China. Uh, yeah. It now says designed somewhere else, funded. Yeah. Somewhere else. Yeah, Cupertino. Oh, right, in England. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I mean, are you ready for Germany yet? Are you ready for Dresden yet, Irene? Um, I downloaded an app for my iPhone that should translate German uh, for me, but that's about it. <laughs> but are they accurate? <laughs> <laughs> Could be fun. Yeah, yeah, I do. I'm, I'm looking forward to the trip. Yeah, that, that was a great cool. talk, John, as as usual. Thank you. Still in Alaska, Irene. You failed on us. Went to NASA, right? Uh, oh yeah, I wasn't the only one, apparently, though. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was kind of awkward timing, but. It's all right. You missed the mosquitoes. They were uh, pretty deadly. <laughs> We had mosquitoes in Virginia too. <laughs> Feeling very grateful uh, for where I live right now, I guess. <laughs> How's your lab setup going? Uh, yeah, all right. Slow, but uh, not too bad. It, 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 it's getting set up. I have people working now, so that uh, is a bonus. <laughs> How about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, probably about the same. Uh, I just got a couple of grad students, um, uh -huh. but yeah, try to spend the summer working with them. Uh, slow process, isn't it? Yeah. Although you probably, how different was it to setting up in the Bauer uh, Fellowship? That was um, more independent, right? Yeah, although in the Bauer, they had a lot of equipment already there, so okay. you could kind of go in and within a month, you know, run a gel and do basic yeah. experiments. But yeah, it was kind of scary to to get to my lab at Santa Barbara where there's you know, nothing. nothing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a bit different than walking into a pre-set up lab, isn't it? And you can actually do things straight away. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it where, where is your office relative to your lab? If you go out the door, where where do you where you go? Uh, so now I am two four floors below my lab. Um, but they're building me a new office that's on the side of the lab, so soon I'll be able to look from my office window through the lab to make sure people are working. <laughs> when, you, when you open the door, you can crack the whip. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Although they, they can look into my office as well, right, see that I'm working, so uh, it, it works both ways. I, I, yeah, I need a one way mirror, you're right. <laughs> yeah. We we have a holiday on the on on the first, which is a Monday, so I had my lab over last night. They all left around midnight. And so uh <laughs> this this morning was a little rough getting up.
How are you doing, Nick? Doing well. How about yourself? Pretty well. I was just explaining my lab was over last night. We uh, were getting ready for the, for the July 1st holiday, right? So we have our uh, quintessential American holiday this week. Also coming up. <laughs> This is this is Harry. Could I interrupt? Um, I think we might be ready to start. It's now 10:26. Uh, Peter, are you going to present, or will it be Paul or uh, or um, Niles? Or all three of you. I, I'll share my desktop, and I will present the first part of the talk, and then uh, Paul and Niles will will present while I change the slides. So hopefully that will work. I think I can only allow one person at a time to be the presenter. So, and right now it's you. When you want Paul right. to talk, I'll I have to do that something on my machine. Talk to me though, and, and that everybody will be able to hear, right? So uh, I think that's yes. it. I'll just be changing the slides for their part. So uh, I see Irene is not back. Let's wait another minute to, to get Irene on. Uh, Irene is now on. Irene is on. Hello. Ram is not yet on, and Veronica is not yet on. So let's give them another minute. Veronica's on. I have, on. And Ram is on. Okay. Everyone's I have here. Just mute, I have just muted my side. That's all. But that's oh, okay. <laughs> so, Peter, I think everyone's ready, so you're on. All right. I'll just try to share my desktop here. Hopefully, this is all going to work. I'm not sure what you guys are seeing, but. Uh, Can you guys see this? Yes. And uh, Paul and I, if you can speak. Yeah. All right, so I can hear you, yeah? Okay, so I think uh, we're ready to go. Everybody ready? All right, so, um, so Paul, Niles, and myself have been very interested in, in, a, in a phase of the early Earth that that would immediately follow that of what John was just describing. And we're going to tell you uh, what the progress we've been making in the last year. And um, we'll alternate back and forth during the presentation. So Paul is at McMaster University. I'm at Simon Fraser University and Niles is at uh, Portland. All right, so we're very interested in how you bootstrap the process of going from an abiotic world to a biological one where you have evolution. So the abiotic world of the sort that John was describing hopefully ends up with complicated molecules that can be built into eventually information containing polymers that can be um, ultimately ultimately yield sequences that contain information in two ways. Not only not only the information of, um, of, a, of, of a polymer, but also the fact that it can actually do a catalytic function. And this, this allows you to set up all the catalytic sets of molecules that um, can reinforce each other and, and, and propagate just as modern biology does today. So we're very interested in how that comes to be, not from the point of view of the of the very detailed and um, and um, more profound chemistry of what what uh, John was explaining as to how these monomers came to be, but how these monomers could be put together into polymers such that you can get these autocatalytic sets. So the way that we're thinking about this, and I think this resonates quite well with what John uh, has been describing, is that abiotic chemistry has to set up a scaffold. Uh, such that life can emerge from it. And without that scaffold, 
we're not going to have uh, the possibility for evolution to take place. And, uh, we think of this as uh, reaching a tipping point where simple molecules through abiotic chemistry uh, eventually uh, are synthesized by abiotic processes into more and more complex molecules. These complex molecules have to reach a point, which is at the bottom of this graphic, where you eventually have the potential to make uh, information containing molecules. And these information containing molecules, as I said, hopefully can also do catalytic reactions that uh, are autocatalytic and therefore uh, be the genesis for life. So on, on this axis here, we're representing in a very schematic way the, the abundance of molecules that we would have. And we would have a very large amount of very simple molecules. And then we would imagine that abiotic chemistry would give rise to more and more complex molecules, as uh, John was describing, that ultimately uh, give rise to the potential for evolution as this complexity grows. So if, if we had um, the ability to have abiotic uh, scaffolding that gives rise to, to complex molecules that have the potential to evolve, so by potential we mean that if you remove the abiotic molecules, there's um, the life would, would actually be able to, um, well, that would be the genesis moment when this actually happens, the tipping point where you go from the abiotic to the biotic world, that you would be able to keep track by some mechanism of the complex molecules that you have generated in the abiotic world. You would keep track of these things in a very natural abiotic fashion such that it would eventually evolve into the life of the human today. So this is this is where we're focusing our our, our efforts, and we believe it would be very important to have some kind of porous uh, system or, or a way of confining larger and more complex molecules away from simpler ones. As these larger, more complex molecules are the things that are going to be built into the metabolism and the information storing components of a living organism uh, once life actually arises. So then this would work as follows. Um, eventually, the more and more complex molecules that are in this semi-porous confined system are interacting together such that they are able to build more and more of the molecules that were initially provided by an abiotic environment and are less and less dependent on the molecules that used to be uh, produced abiotically and are now being produced by uh, proto-metabolism. And as this occurs uh, further and further uh, into the process of reaching a living and evolving system, eventually you reach the point where biochemistry is now purely on the inside of the system and the abiotic world is on the outside and you have reached uh, a situation that more or less resembles that of today just in an embryonic state where you have complex polymers on the inside of the system controlling a biochemistry that used to be supported by um, the abiotic scaffold that allowed the tipping point to be. So we, we, we know that from the point of view of this, the, the complex molecules that are required for biochemistry, that RNA is a really uh, good potential candidate for this kind of a molecule, the kind of polymer that might be around at the tipping point from an abiotic world to a biotic one. We, we certainly don't know for sure that it is, but it does seem highly suggestive of um, uh, evolutionary patterns that we see today and that of the kind of abiotic reactions that John and others have been looking at in the past recently, that RNA may, might have been quite prominent in this, in this process. So, um, with that in mind, we do know that RNA can be made into quite complicated uh, catalytic molecules. Certainly, we have lots of uh, complicated RNA molecules keeping us alive today, but that uh, it can be made through artificial in vitro selection that all that seem very uh, natural reactions that would be important very early in the origin of life. And this is an example of class one ligase that we can evolve into an RNA polymerase right line can extend the primer template to the triphosphate. So all of this is suggestive that RNA early on might have been able to do aspects of what is now modern metabolism with very small molecules. So our, our focus has been on this, this transition from um, the, the prebiotic to the 
not have its role. Uh, when RNA uh, being a representative of candidate molecules is such a trend. So Paul is going to talk about how that uh, this is modeled and the importance of uh, a better uh, for the emergence of an evolving system. So Paul, if you can uh, tell me when you're going to change the slides, I will I will change the slides very quickly. Okay, do you want to hand over to me? Uh, yes, please. Okay, so um, can you hear me now? Because the sound is not too good on our end. I, I hear it fine. Okay, so um, I just wanted to. One, one second. I think it's important if everybody is muted except for the seat. Everybody. Okay. Okay, so. Um, I wanted to mention uh, Meng Wu, who's a, a student of mine, been working with me for several years, who's done a lot of the, the work prior to this year. And then Julie Shea is the student who's been sponsored by Harry, so thank, thank you very much for that. And we're interested in the origin of the RNA world because we believe that there's a lot of evidence that RNA can carry out the kind of reactions that are needed in, uh, in organisms. We, we know that RNA can be both a genome and a catalyst. And we want to know how do we get from a chemical system in which uh, there's random synthesis of nucleotides and, uh, and random short sequences to a biological system where we have well-specified ribozymes that are, that are doing particular jobs. Okay, next, uh, next please. And this, this picture actually comes from a textbook. I call it the, the, the textbook picture of the um, origin of the RNA world. And we imagine that there's a chemical system, maybe it's a clay catalyst that can form RNA oligomers. And Peter's going to be talking about clay catalyzed um, RNA synthesis in a few minutes. And from that chemical system, some of those sequences become long enough to have well-defined RNA secondary structures. And some of them become structures that actually have a function as well. And eventually, those functions become good enough to separate from the surface they were on and to become independent replicators. So that picture is kind of out there, and it, it makes sense, but we want more than a cartoon. We want to know how did the autocatalytic polymers emerge from a system of random uh, chemical synthesis that was there before. Uh, next, please. So we, for a while now, we've been working on this reaction scheme, which says that we have some precursor molecules which were present on the early Earth. And we have a monomer synthesis reaction. Um, and then the monomers can polymerize to form polymers. And, and I'm thinking, of course, of monomers of being nucleotides and polymers of being uh, uh, RNA. But it could be something similar, but not quite the same. So there could be, there could be alternative uh, RNA analogs which work in the same way. So from the, from the um, theoretical point of view, what's important is that we have uh, um, a small set of monomers that can form polymers and that the polymers interact with one another with complementary base pairing. It could be something like RNA, if not exactly RNA. So the top line of my, uh, of my scheme there is something which can occur by chemistry, right? So what's important is that we have chemistry before biology. Um, the chemistry can at least make monomers. That's what John Sunderland's been talking about. And we assume that the monomers can polymerize. And in fact, David Diemer's group is, is, is trying to make polymers out of RNA monomers. So we assume that all that is chemistry. And it goes on to some extent, but maybe not very well. So prebiotic chemistry doesn't give you a whole load of beautiful functioning ribozymes in one go. But it has to be able to make some polymers at least uh, to some extent, because otherwise we never get started. So. In this environment, when the prebiotic chemistry is happening, we eventually get some long random polymers, and some small number of those actually do something useful. So those are the ribozymes. And if the ribozymes arise, they, they can then catalyze the steps that form them. So the two most important things then are, are that the ribozymes might catalyze the polymerization step and speed up forming more polymers. Or they might catalyze the nucleotide synthesis, which means that they increase the concentration of the monomers that are needed to build more ribozymes. And um, when we study those reaction schemes, what we find is that there are two stable states, which I call living and dead. 
So uh, a dead state is one in which the reactions are spontaneous chemical reactions and which are slow. Uh, and a living state is one in which there are rapid reactions controlled by the ribosomes. And uh, in the, when we write down the chemical reactions, we find both of those states exist. And what I call the origin of life then is a transition from the dead state to the living state. And um, I just want to point out those the, the diagrams at the bottom of the page there have, um, they show the regions of parameter space where the living and dead states exist. And in each of those graphs we have on the, on the horizontal axis, we have a chemical axis. So the chemical axis tells us how good is prebiotic chemistry at making the ribosomes. And the vertical axis is a biology axis, which tells us how good are the ribozymes when they are formed. And um, there are two cases there which look pretty similar. The, the left case is when we have um, when the ribozymes are polymerases, and the right case is when the ribozymes are nucleotide synthetases. But, they, but the shape of those diagrams is the same. And what we see is at the bottom, there's a dead region. There's a state that says dead only. That means that if the biology is poor, then you can't have life, right? If the, if the ribozymes are no good when you form them, then you're always in the dead state. That's the bottom left. That's if good you question. look at the Yes. Sorry, to interrupt. But uh, there's is all the living state above the red line and all the dead state below the blue line? There's okay, so there's two different there's, ways of drawing that boundary line. Let's not go well, there right now. We, that, sorry, there's just more than one state as I see it, that there's intermediate between the dead and the living. I wondered what they were. There are two boundary lines, depending on yeah. how we define what's dead and what's living. And let's, let's. Is that not important? Uh, I don't know. I'm just asking it. OK. So the, the, the easiest way of defining the distinction between dead and living as we cross that red dotted line is the fact that the, uh, the synthesis of the polymers occurs faster by the autocatalytic route than the chemical route. That, that would be the red dotted line, okay? Mm -hmm. But as we move across the red dotted line, there's only, there's only one state and that moves smoothly from living to death, right? Yeah. Whereas what is most important on this diagram is the, is the black lines that separate the region where both states exist. So let, me just, let me just go back and say why it's important that there are two, that there are two states, okay? I was saying that at the bottom of that diagram, we're dead only. That means that only the only the state controlled by the chemistry exists. That's when the that's when the biology is bad. Okay. If we go to the top right, we're in the living only state, which is when both the chemistry and the biology are good. So that that if if the world were like that, then we would be having um, we would be having spontaneous life popping up in everybody's lab. We wouldn't be having research questions about how does the origin of life happen because it would happen in everybody's lab. We wouldn't be even worrying about it, okay? So, so the real world is in the top left of those diagrams, which is when chemistry is bad and biology is good, okay? So it says the chemistry, it's, it's not zero. The chemistry gives you something, but you have to wait a long time and you don't get many of them, right? So the chemistry is not very good at creating these, these, these ribozymes. But when they occur, they are good, and so the state that's controlled by the ribozymes exists. Okay, so so that's the that's the region of parameter space we're interested in. And then we're interested in the mechanism of getting from the dead state to the living state. And well, I, this is Pat Paul. Excuse me. This is Harry. Let me interrupt. Are there units for your for your symbol K? This efficiency is it a percentage? What what are the units? The it's units right. are relative to the death rate of the polymer. So we, so, so in the reaction equations, we, we say that one is the lifetime of a polymer. So that, but so, so, yeah, so, so that all the polymers are disappearing at a certain rate, and one unit of time is the is the lifetime of one chain, and then everything else is relative to that. So, so um, it's molecules per second or something. But are there units you could stick on it? So the K rate is measured in units which are relative to the death to the death rate, okay? And and I don't know what that death rate is. So if we, so so I can't give you definite units in years or in, in milliseconds or whatever you want them in, right? But I can I say, it. yeah. I got it. Okay. So so let's move to the next slide, please. 
So I want to say where 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 were we at the beginning of this year, right? So we've shown that there are two states that exist, and we'd argue that the transition is a stochastic transition from the living state to the dead, from the dead state to the living state. And we've shown that the spatial uh, aspect is very important because when we have molecules that are distributed on a surface, then we get local concentration fluctuations. And that occurs in a model where you have uh, limited diffusion and, lo and, uh, uh, and local motion of molecules, okay? And it occurs much more, diff more uh, less easily, let's say, if we have a well-mixed system where, every where molecules bump into each other at random. So we're arguing that the spatial thing is very important for this to occur. So what we wanted to show this year, and this is what Julie has been working on, is we want to take those, those bottom points into account. So, we, so only a very small fraction of the sequences that are formed by the random chemistry will actually do anything useful. So, we, what, what, so, so the random chemistry is going to make many other sequences, and we need to show that the catalyst can spread in the presence of those many other sequences that are not functional. And the catalyst is a cooperator or an altruist in the evolutionary biology sense because it copies another sequence which is a template. So it doesn't use itself as a template, it uses another sequence as a template, and that means that um, we have this problem with parasites, which is a big problem in evolutionary biology in general. So, so if we have a non-functional sequence, which is not a catalyst, it can nevertheless be a template, and that means it functions as a parasite on the, re on the replicator. So we need to show that the, the replicators can survive in the presence of those non-functional parasite sequences. And we also need to show that the, repli that the replicator can survive even though it has limited fidelity. We don't want to propose that the replication is perfect. It can make errors. So there's an error threshold aspect to this. So, so we want to put all those ingredients into the model. So next slide, please. So um, there are going to be, this is the, this is the uh, a simple spatial model. It's going to have three kinds of molecules in it. And an X is a catalyst, which is a polymerase. Uh, a W is a complementary sequence to X. And Y is any other sequence. So, so X and W are well-specified sequences that, that do something, right? Whereas Y is anything else which is not one of those. And I want to start off with so what would prebiotic chemistry be like in this model? It only has Y. It has random sequences which are not catalysts. And in this model, there's a rate, which is creation of a, of a Y. That's monomers form a random sequence. So that rate S is telling me how fast the random sequences form. And they also have an R rate, which is a Y makes another, another Y. So that is a template directed process, but it's not catalyzed. So, so for example, Irene's been working on that, showing that many different templates can form, many different sequences can act as templates. And I want to call both of those things dead, right? Because they're not specific sequences. Um, whereas what I call living is when I have a, a specific sequence which is a catalyst and which replicates itself. So in the dead state, what I have is just these wide random sequences. I have a low density moving about randomly on my surface. Um, so that's what prebiotic chemistry looks like in this model. So let's move on to the next slide. So now I want to say what happens if we add one catalyst. So we wait for our 100 million years or whatever, however long it takes, and we, might, we find a functional molecule. I want to show that that functional molecule can spread in, that, in those conditions. So the reactions that we need now is an X is a template that makes a W, and a W is a template that makes an X. So those R reactions are, those are template-directed synthesis without catalysts. And then I have my K reactions, which is when, if I have two Xs come together on a site, then one X is a catalyst, one X is a template, and it makes another W. And if an X comes together with a W, then the X is a catalyst that replicates the W, makes another X. And the X can come together with a Y and make another Y, okay? So the, so the X is a fair, it's a fair catalyst that, that copies all the other templates equally well. It's not assumed to recognize itself. And so we let the simulation go, and we add very small numbers of the catalysts, and we want to know whether whether a patch of, of replicators can spread from a single or, from a single origin. And in the picture, this is a case where it has spread. 
So the little cluster of yellow and orange ones on the uh, on the left there has originated in the sim in the simulation from a single addition of one X, and that patch um, is going to spread over time, and eventually it takes over the whole system, like on the right. Okay. So, so the whole system has now gone into the living state on the in the, in the right hand picture, and um, so the the argument is then that that the origin of life you have to wait for a, a rare random event which involves a small number of molecules in one particular place in space, and if that little patch gets big enough to be stable, then it becomes deterministic. So the, the origin part is stochastic. You don't know how long it's going to take. You have to wait a long time. But once you've got those little patch of replicators that's stable, then it's going to spread rapidly over the whole system. And uh, Paul, can, I just, of, can I interrupt you for one second? I just want to clarify line two. That is that W goes to W plus X? That W... That lines, okay, X goes to X plus W, W goes to W. I guess that's a mistake, yes. Sorry. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yes, okay. There's always a, I don't know how many times you, you can look at these, and there's always a mistake. Okay, but they, yeah, it's complementary sequence replication. That's right. I think we're ready for the next slide, please, Peter. Yeah, okay. So the final point I want to talk about is the fact that replication is inaccurate. And um, so I want to turn on mutation. So mutation means that when I copy an X, it should make a W, a complementary sequence, but sometimes it makes a random Y instead, okay? And what we find is that the system still survives in the presence of these mutations. And that picture there is a, uh, is a snapshot of the what the living state looks like in the presence of mutations. And it's actually very patchy. So whereas the last one, it was basically yellow and orange catalyst molecules all over the place. What we see when we turn on the mutations is a patchy distribution where there's some places of high density of the replicators and there's some empty, the light gray places are empty places. And so uh, the point is that the, the, the replicator still survives in the presence of mutation in this patchy way in space. And the reason that's important is because if we have rapid diffusion, then we mix everything together. And in that well-mixed system, the, the parasites destroy the system, okay? So in fact, this is an example of something that's really understood in many different places in evolution of biology. If you have well-mixed things, then, the, the, then parasites tend to be very uh, dangerous and they destroy the system. And the local diffusion is important for allowing the, the replicator to survive in the presence of the parasite. I've got conclusions there at the bottom. Um, what we've shown this year then is that the origin of life can emerge by the stochastic process, even when the fraction of functional sequence is very, very small, even when replication is inaccurate, and even when non functional templates act as parasites. And we've said that the local diffusion in the in the spatial model is essential both to allow the origin of life and to the survival against parasites. So the, the, the conditions of, of slow diffusion on a surface promote both the origin and the survival. Other questions? Yeah. Dave Beaver, do I have, I have a question? Uh, in your definition of a parasite, are they feeding on the catalyst or are they out competing the catalyst or the nutrients that you have in the system? So I think the question was, what's the definition of a parasite, right? Yeah. So, um, so a parasite is any sequence which can be a template, but which can't be a catalyst, right? And, and so the simplest way of thinking about that is that if I, if I replicate a catalyst I'm gonna, uh, with an error, then I make a non-functional catalyst. And so one or two errors in that sequence are gonna be enough to stop it functioning as a catalyst, but it's still going to be almost the same sequence, so it's still going to be a good template. And so we're producing these non-functional copies all the time, and those are parasites because they can they waste the time of the catalyst. That's the point. They, the, the, the catalyst wastes their time replicating these non-functional sequences. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I I'm finished, and we're going to hand back to Peter, right? Okay. So. 
Bear, bearing in mind what. Uh, Thank you, Paul. Sorry, Harry. Did you say something? No, I just wanted to thank Paul. Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. So what we, what we've been thinking about is very much along the lines of what Paul has been describing. We're just trying to realize the the abiotic chemistry that would give rise to the emergence of a uh, an eventual RNA catalyst or a polymer catalyst that could actually uh, give this autocatalytic catalytic feedback that we have been studying in. Um, well, well, both Niles and I have been studying experimentally with um, experimentally evolved uh, ribozymes. So the question that we're focusing on here is, is how do you build polymers uh, abiotically and get them to the point where they can actually um, do some interesting chemistry? So this Martin is a, a, a master's student that just joined in September of this, of this year, and she's been working on this project and has been gaining uh, a lot of experience uh, in the laboratory and has uh, her results that I'm, I'm presenting here. So uh, the first thing that she established was a, a machine that she's planning to use in the coming year uh, to actually try to cycle uh, samples. So it's a fairly straightforward design. It's a heat through the which has a temperature regulated chamber that can go between minus 20 and that's 50 degrees centigrade. We're not planning to go that hot. But, um, but uh, is, a, is a chamber that can either be fitted with a strip or can just allow the uh, fluid to circulate uh, through through this temperature regulated uh, chamber. And in principle, we could add additional chambers uh, as, as needed. Uh, obviously, if we go to lower temperatures and we form an ice, uh, the pump has to be stopped before uh, pumping uh, in, the, in the ice. So we have the potential to change phases in the liquid uh, from, from liquid to solid, and we have the ability to retain uh, salt particles in, in the chamber or not, depending on how we design the experiment. So a fairly straightforward design, and she uh, demonstrated that this will work. Uh, in order to in order to utilize this intelligently, we need a lot more uh, chemical information about the type of abiotic catalytic systems that we'd be putting into this chamber. And we've been focusing on uh, a system where we would uh, presume that chemistry of the sort, like uh, uh, John and Matt, has produced uh, nucleotides. And um, what we're talking about specifically is cyclic uh, nucleotides with a, a 2 3 linkage. And I just want to show you on the uh, in the on the left uh, two panels here uh, the type of nucleotides that are used by metabolism in in wildlife for polymerization. And shown here is an example of ATP, which is activated with a triphosphate, or that has been used uh, predominantly by um, uh, prebiotic chemists to explore polymerization activated nucleotides, like the uh, imidazole activated nucleotides. Uh, that has been commonly used by uh, Ferris and others to try to explore the, the question of summarizing. So, what is particularly interesting about uh, is that uh, based on John's research, the environment, these compounds may have been viable precursors for the synthesis of uh, RNA polymers. If so, then there could be a biotic catalyst that could be able to polymerize them effectively. And um, we've been exploring the use of uh, more like clay, which uh, we believe would have the potential to be a, a useful abiotic polymer catalyst. And so just from the other left here is this is clay, which uh, could be produced easily by weathering of volcanic uh, of, of volcanic uh, minerals. And that has the propensity to actually bind nucleic acids onto its surface. And that uh, can allow nucleic acids to be released from its surface in uh, changing small conditions. And it's been used by Crosstex, uh, Orange, and others uh, as a potential link to uh, retention of RNA on such uh, mineral surfaces. And there's a piece of monomerized here inside a, a laminar particle uh, that uh, demonstrates the potential, at least, for a clay transition. A, uh, a version of, of um, replication that could be taking place inside a inside a, a compartmentalized system, just like we do, um, like we have with modern life. So, for those reasons, we think that uh, this type of thing may 
may be quite interesting. And Lissa has um, investigated a number of aspects of Ferris's work with a digital activated on and has moved on to the 